makes up one half of my poly panel. On now alongside Labor MP Patrick Gorman. Thanks, gentlemen, both for your time. So uh, does this mean, Jason, you don't think voters deserve to know that Gladys Berejiklian continued this relationship even after sacking Daryl Maguire um, and these conversations where he's speaking to her about these various, well, schemes and deals he's trying to cook up? Oh, Tom, I reject completely and absolutely your characterisation of what occurred at ICAC last week. What I'm saying is that every Australian, regardless of what position they hold, are entitled to natural justice and the rule of law. ICAC has um, behaved um, in a manner and form that has damaged countless number of people's lives, many of whom, most, in fact all of whom, have turned out to be innocent. The New South Wales Parliament under then Premier Mike Baird, um, I think uh, in one of the less um, honourable moments for Australian parliaments, passed a retrospective piece of legislation to protect ICAC from its own, um, own errors. Uh, if this is the type of body uh, and the design of the type of body that people want here in Canberra, I, I just don't think that's a good idea. Mm. So when you say you reject what happened, uh, these conversations, Daryl Maguire is talking about uh, various ways where he might be able to get uh, deals done. Uh, the common refrain from Gladys Berejiklian is, well, I don't need to know about that before he launches into detail. You don't think voters sh should know well, Tom, any of the interesting that, thing that about, sort of strange nature no, of that? No, Tom, Tom mm. um, let me make it very clear to you that I think that what the one thing that you've just done then, which the media has done throughout this process, is then not make the relevant point that the Australian community needs to know. Now, if they're denied information, then they're denied the truth. And the truth here is that Daryl Maguire was trying to undertake a deal at Badgerys Creek, which the New South Wales government rejected. Um, I've known Gladys Berejiklian for a long time, and the phrase, I don't need to know about that, is her way of saying, I've got enough to think about, I don't actually need to um, be burdened with more information. It's not her. And, and, you know, this is where the media constantly He was also trying to get on a government no, no, trip Tom, to Tom, China. Sorry, with one... Well, well, sorry, me, that... Tom, yeah. that's not what happened. Now, either the media is going to have to decide... He wasn't trying to get ..persecution to of the Premier, whether she knew that the calls were being taped and therefore were undertaking that... It was, um, that's why she would say those things, or she didn't know. Now, the fact of the matter is the media has indulged itself throughout this process and refuses to actually accept one point, which all of these conversations add absolutely no probative value to anything that ICAC is undertaking by ICAC's own admission. Once again, a point that rarely makes it into any of the stories that the media has um, had on this topic. So the second thing I was trying to put to you was um, the other conversations he had to her about him possibly trying to get to China, go to China. Uh, he was Tom, did he go to China? Tom, did he go to well, China? He was, no, I'm not saying that. No, but he was trying so to get did, there. So he, so he didn't go to China. About, he didn't do the land deal. But this she is was the, called well, this in a public hearing. She was called Because he wasn't successful, hearing. nothing happened. Mm. Mm. No, that's not, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. The issues that were raised in the public hearing of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in New South Wales could have easily been handed, and indeed were handled, in a private interview with the Premier. What was the purpose of that public hearing? Hmm. All right, well, I'm conscious we've got another panel I mean, if the, if the point, Patrick Gorman... If the point of an anti-corruption body is to root out corruption, what was the purpose of that hearing? Well, perhaps to go and talk about some of the, the contradictions as well. Gladys Berejiklian was asked, for example, about... You can, do that, you can do that in a private interview, which they did. So what was the purpose of the public hearing? Well, even in this public hearing, when she was asked various things, for example, about, I think it was called the UWE, um, she said she'd never heard of it, and they played a call afterwards where it's mentioned to her by right. Daryl Maguire. Anyway, I, I do want to get to Patrick Gorman. Patrick, okay. do you share any of the concerns about... The public nature of ICAC. Mm. I know Margaret Kaneen, for example, you know, you can see a reputation there that essentially was unfairly tarnished. Do we need to be careful about how a federal one would work? Well, uh, I don't believe that you should use the argument of being careful for inaction. And I think that's what we're seeing from the government at the moment is saying, well, these things are complex, you know, we need to go very slowly. Uh, I don't think that they actually want to do this. If they did, they would have released the draft legislation that we heard in Senate estimates they already have for consultation. 
They should put that legislation out. And when it comes to what commu the community expects, I don't think there's that many people who are concerned about the idea that an independent corruption fighting body would call a Premier to give evidence. Indeed, that is exactly what should happen when there are concerns. Politicians, and indeed very senior politicians, are accountable to the public and they are open to scrutiny. Um, I don't believe that we should be uh, putting pressure on independent bodies like this uh, as an excuse and a distraction from the real fact, which is we don't right, have but, a national body to do this work. But, but when you say not be careful, shouldn't we be careful? I mean, you want to set something up that, yes, is able to focus on corruption, but not, you know, unnecessarily um, tarnish people's reputations. What's wrong with the word careful there? Well, I, I look, uh, if Christian Porter is not capable of doing that, then maybe he shouldn't be in his job. Uh, it is entirely possible to have... Right. So a, being careful is OK. A, a corruption... Being careful is OK, but being, but being so careful that you do nothing is unacceptable. Uh, we elect politicians, and indeed Minister's job is to act and to lead. Uh, he needs to put the legislation out there, and then we can have an actual informed discussion rather than just sort of worries about what might or might not be in the secret legislation that Christian Porter has had mm. for some 10 months now and refused to release. And we also have other models. Uh, I know that uh, the New South Wales ICAC is a headline-grabbing body, but uh, the Corruption Crime Commission in Western Australia is another good model that has rooted out corruption in Western Australia. Uh, it is, has extensive powers and it is a successful model. So we don't just need to look at New South Wales as the, uh, as the model for everything we should do federally. Uh, it's a federation right. and a whole bunch of other places we can get ideas from. Let, let me ask you this, uh, Jason. You're obviously sceptical about the role uh, necessarily of, of um, an ICAC such as New South Wales. What about for integrity and monitoring spending and so on, the Australian National Audit Office? The budget, as a result of not giving the $6.5 million the Audit Office wanted, now the audit office will be doing fewer performance audits with a record mm. amount of spending rolling out right now by the government. How can you defend yeah. that? Uh, so, Tom, um, I, I'm still concerned about the attitude regarding the New South Wales ICAC. I mean, Lord Denning said, I believe it was Lord Denning who said, it is better to let 10 guilty men go free than to condemn one innocent man to, to persecution. We seem to have the opposite in the New South Wales Independent C Commission Against Corruption. And I guess the other point that I would make to people who are not from New South Wales is that the anti-corruption body in New South Wales is, let, is yet to secure one conviction for corruption. One conviction for corruption. So once again, I ask the question, how successful has this body actually been in rooting out corruption? To your well, question about the, the ANA... The question I asked you about the Audit Office. Yeah, yeah. To your question about the Audit Office, yeah, look, I'm, I'm not across what the budgetary requirements are for the Audit Office... Um, but I'm what telling I would you what say they are. is that yeah, but there what are I would fewer say performance to you audits is, year on year as a result yeah. of the last budget. Thank, thank you, Tom. But what I would say is that quite clearly um, what we have found over and over again is that it is possible often to hide the, an act of corruption, but it is very, very hard to hide the flow of money. And what is going on or, or what was uncovered at Badgerys Creek um, the hard forensic mm. work that was undertaken to um, discover that, the fact that that has now been bundled up in a brief evidence for the AFP to investigate, who will then take that brief to the um, right. Commonwealth so Director of Public Prosecution is, is one way, some would argue a better way, but one way I think that you are going to root out corruption more systemically. So, right, I just don't understand how that's a response, though, to the Audit Office will now be able to do fewer performance audits. Well, the, the answer, Tom, to your question is, I don't know what the situation at the audit office is or their budgetary requirements. I don't know if that necessarily... Well, the, the, the budget that says in black be... and white, 42, yes. then 40, then 38 performance audits each year over forward estimates. They are doing fewer audits because they have budgetary shortcomings. How can the government right. defend that at a time when the audit office presumably is so important? Uh, Tom, I, Tom, I wasn't involved in that decision. I don't know, but we do live in a time where we're going to obviously have far more constrained um, financial resources at a government level as we come out of this pandemic. I can't answer your question, sorry. 
then right. surely I in a surely in a resource constrained environment, you actually want to make sure that you're spending government money appropriately. If you're not giving the Australian National Audit Office the resources it needs, I wanna, how do you know in that resource I constrained get one, environment you're not spending money effectively? I want to get to one final issue just with you, Patrick Gorman. Um, WA border approach. We haven't spoken for a while. Since then, Mark McGowan has said other states just want the borders open because they want WA money. Um, we've had the uh, Chief Health Officer in WA say there are options for WA to open up more. W what do you think mm. families in WA will be thinking about some of the Premier's comments when you know, they haven't seen grandkids, grandparents, other loved ones for so long? Yeah, we've got to approach these compassionately. Um, I think sometimes in the heat of some of these debates, and they've been very heated between the federal government and the various state governments, uh, we have sort of, uh, there has been a bit of a compassion deficit. We need to make sure that we're approaching these things and recognising that these decisions do have... So WA has a compassion deficit? Uh, in some of these heated debates, uh, and I've reflected on some of my own language uh, in recent months, uh, sometimes you've got to remember there are real people on either sides of this country who want to connect, want to get back together. I don't think any Australian actually wants borders. We just need them as a health response. And I think that's a really important principle. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, as soon as it is safe to remove these borders, I think people will want to see that happen. But the CHO uh, is saying the chief, there uh, can be a, the chief, an approach that's still I, safe I'm that opens up the borders more. And seemingly I'm, I'm encouraged that the Chief Health Officer in Western Australia has said one week ago that they'll be reviewing it in two weeks. That is, in about seven days' time from now, these matters that will be subject to new advice. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, that allows for more family reunion, more Australians to come home mm. to Western Australia if they are overseas. Um, we are right. obviously, thanks to the hard work in particular of Victorians, and I do want to say as a West Australian, thank you to all Victorians who have gone through an incredibly okay. painful lockdown. Um, that has allowed uh, some of these things to be reviewed. And um, while it's got, got to, to leave, leave it. by the health advice. Okay. Sorry, got to leave it there. Hard We've out. Gone way over Thanks, time. Tom. Hard out. Patrick, Jason. Hard out. Talk soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, when we Tom, come back, I'll be.